They said you were the best in the Parsec. Welcome to Parsec Passion, a podcast covering Star Wars TV shows on Disney+. Plus. Now we're covering Ender, Cassian Ender. My name's Bubba, and with me, as always, is someone who I intuit has no future prospects. It's Catfish. Catfish, how are you? I'm just going to end and not finish that sentence like these episodes just don't end. How you doing? Bubba, I'm completely fine, and I've been totally honest with you. My name is Jake. Thanks, Jake. I recognize you, Clem. We're going to be breaking down Andor Season 1, Episode 5, The Axe Forgets. But the tree remembers. Later on, we'll be answering your feedback, and we got some great feedback this week. Plus, we'll be playing our Bounty Hunter Guild battle, where we debate the question, shouldn't freedom fighters also get paid in 401ks and dental? But before then, Catfish, what is your rating for episode five? Well, Bubba, I am going to give this four points for each schedule. Which is my favorite way that the Brits say a word, schedule. And that is right. I'm giving this eight triple S's. Wait, triple S's? Yeah. Slouching sad sack cereals. Suck it up, cereal. So sad, sad cereal. I'm going to give it eight out of ten. We had a lot of stuff go on here. I love the setup. I, I love some of the stuff. That is just basically Cassie and realizing, like, how the heck were you going to do this without me? The seven saps, the six saps desperately needed the seventh. It's good setup. It just ends. Also, yeah, tri- triple S, triple the S. seven saps got their steps in. <laughs> in this episode, they, I hope they had their iPhones on them, any of their Apple oh, appliances, because yeah. they were getting it done. So I enjoyed it more than I thought. Last week, I suspected that you would not enjoy it because it wasn't telling a complete mini story. You were down on it because of that, Bubba? Yeah. I'm sure you're feeling a lot better about it this week. What was your rating? I am slouching, I am soggy, a bit like Cyril's cereal. I'm tough, because just like last week, there's so much in this I love. There's almost, I don't have any problem with it other than it just ends. And so I'm going to give this seven double P's out of ten. Double P's? Well, double P's is when you're making a million-dollar Star Wars show, and you have to pull out Polaroid props. (laughs) That's right, when you have to make a prop, out of an old Polaroid camera because you spent all your money on location shooting instead of in the volume. I think that this is the perfect middle of a movie, of a story. It's a fine middle of a story. Problem is, is that we spent seven days since we saw the beginning of this story, and we're not going to see the end until seven days later. For me, they have to release season two in three episode chunks where you can go through all of it. This show is very effective. This might be one of the few times when you hear that sound of a TIE fighter coming and the characters are nervous and I'm nervous for them. So it is definitely effective. It's working. But the way if I were in charge and I always refer to soap operas, I always say my mom divorced my father. I live with my mom and my two sisters. And so they got on soap operas and hooked me on soap operas. The way this should work is if you're going to do just a setup episode of getting ready for the big heist, which is going to be next week, then one of your other storylines has to take that place. I always mention Game of Thrones, and I mention it not to spoil a Game of Thrones for anybody, but so many people have watched that show, they kind of understand how it works. So if you watch Game of Thrones, there are setup episodes where, okay, we're going to set up that the Battle of King's Landing is going to be tomorrow, or the battle against the White Walker is going to be tomorrow, aka the next episode. But what they do is one of the other storylines will take the cake. So like in season two, somebody's going to attack King's Landing, it's going to happen, but it's not going to happen until tomorrow. So some of the other storylines kind of have payoffs where the other characters get moving, get momentum. They get big character moments. In the final season of Game of Thrones, there's an entire episode that is nothing but set up the day before a big battle. And yet they gave a character who always kind of wanted to be a knight. They gave that character a big character moment of, hey, I get to be a knight. And there were, you know, reveals and kind of changes. And one person found out another person's parentage secret. So there was stuff in it even though it was really all just setting up a battle. This show 
We are setting up this heist, and we have other characters. Like, look at Cyril Karn. He is crying at the sunrise. He is enjoying his sad, silky cereal. Cyril is. We know something's going to happen with him. Why have a whole episode of him just in stasis? Why not, if Andor's not going to do his heist in this episode, why not have Cyril kind of, okay, get to wherever his next journey's going to go? Why have Mon Mothma just another day in the life of her misery? Why not see something she does? She accomplishes something. And so we could see that, and that little beat of her accomplishing something gives us a resolution of, okay, this, this episode showed me this. Instead, it was like a day in the life for these characters. I loved the stuff of Mon Mothma's day in the life. I liked Cyril getting set, slapped around by his mom. But there's got to be something to it rather than it just constantly feeling like it's ending. So seven out of 10, that's me. We love to say, who cares what I think? <laughs> we want to know what you think. Write to us on social media at Double PHQ. Tell us you love it and you don't mind these episodes. You love the episodes and want them to keep going. Or if you're like me and have some trouble with the almost formless middle of these three episode arcs, let us know. Catfish, once again, I love so much in this episode, though, so I can't go really below seven out of 10, but I do have that issue. Any comments to you hearing me constantly make this two weeks in a row complaint? Well, I'm not surprised, but funnily enough, these shows sort of aren't set up in movies or uh, because in kind of the second act of a movie, our characters kind of experience the downturn or the opposing action. Mm -hmm. And we don't really see any of that in this. You know, I mean, even in the Star Wars universe, you know, the second movie, we've got uh, Han, Frozen, you know, stuff like that. Well, that's where... at the end, in, in the middle of that second movie. You know, they do kind of just hang out in a, in the belly of a space beast for a bit. But it, it is like a call to action to do something else, I guess, is what I'd say. Hmm. The middle of the Star Wars movie is, you would say, he gets on a ship and he goes to rescue the princess and then, and then twists and turns. Wait a minute. We're going to this planet. The planet's been blown up. So, hmm. I don't know. I'll, I'll dig into this deeper. All right. I mean, the only thing that really goes wrong for our characters, mm -hmm. besides this is the first time we see, uh, we, we have to decide whether Mon Mothma's home life is worse than Cyril's, is <laughs> that we see that the uh, Seven Saps uh, really does not seem very hopeful for them. But other than that, great news, no guys. Real... Great news. There's this getaway ship. Nobody knows how to fly it, but it, we can't fail. <laughs> it might be in the shop. It might be hung up. Hey, we don't. might have to use the winch. <laughs> All right. Hey, let's do some quick hits before we dive into that. All right, let's do it. Zero Karn's mom. I believe her mm -hmm. name is Edie. Is mm -hmm. she the best or the worst? Is she the best because seeing her slap her son Cyril is wonderful? Or is she the worst? Because, Mom, give me a break. I just lost my job. I'll be back. Well, Bubba, considering yeah. uh, what she's known as, Double E. Wait, Double E? Yeah, emasculating Edie. I would say she's maximizing her potential. <laughs> she's being the very best Double E she can be. Say that again. It, it makes me feel better about my mom. I love you, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> compared to Edie, it's like, Mom, you've been the greatest mother of the world. I say that Edie is so wonderfully terrible. Uh -huh. like she's, she's so soft power negative that she should be a host on OAN. Listeners, look it up. Don't look it up, actually, OAN. Anyway, I, I guess I kind of love her. I love Edie. I hope, she, I hope she gets out there and helps Cyril a lot. Okay, speaking of other characters who may or may mm -hmm. not be the best slash the worst, this is a game we play on our Babylon Berlin Babel podcast, but who's the worst? Is Mon Mothma's husband Perrin the worst, or is it her daughter, Lita? Who's the worst, Catfish? It's without a doubt for me, double L. Double L? Yeah, larger Leia. <laughs> She's like Leia, but older. Little Leia was a pain, but now we see it can get worse. It's going to get worse before it gets better. She's like little Leia larger. If Lita had been the character that Obi-Wan had to rescue on his show, 
Do you think he would have just left her behind somewhere? <laughs> like, that's fine. She's there's in no hope for the rebellion. Inquisitorious. Yeah. <laughs> the dark side was right. <laughs> well, as rough as Lita is, I'm actually going with Mon Mothma's husband. I say Perrin is a son of a bith. Oh, Star Wars oh. reference. The aliens who played in the cantina in the original New Hope Star Wars movie were Biths. I'm clever. Now, I did put that out that out uh, on Twitter just literally a couple of minutes ago. And our great double L. Double L. Loyal listener, Sean Gregan, who's at Hey Ref on Twitter. He wanted to get in on this. And he said, the kid gets a pass. Dad is clearly the problem here. Ouch. So he he agrees he agrees with me, Catfish. It's parent. Uh, I mean, you could say that, yeah. and he did, and you yeah. did, <laughs> right? <laughs> but uh, you know, there's no literally no hope for <laughs> uh, for the father. I mean, he's already cast his lot. He's been fully. He's he is all OAN all the time, and. Uh, <laughs> It's the daughter. I mean, look, Mon Mothma yeah. didn't bring her husband into this world. She just made a huge mistake and married him. Well, what I love is you just called Perrin no hope. So that would be like Star Wars episode 0.5, a no hope. <laughs> um, our next rapid fire question, Catfish, mm -hmm. is last week we were debating about, okay, how we many of the Aldani, now there are seven, are going to die in the heist in the mission. So this week, let's have a different bit of prediction. How will they die in the mission? Slowly and painlessly, how and why will members of the Aldhani 7 die next week in the mission in the heist? Well, Bubba, first, I, I'm sorry, I have to correct myself. After the discussion about the ship and how they have no idea to work it, yeah. I need to revise my answer from last week upwards. I oh, mean, no. Ritz... So upwards, I'm not sure the show is going to be called Andor anymore after the sixth episode. Now, <laughs> Gorn yeah. is obviously going to fall on the tracks. Oh, yeah. yeah. We hardly knew ye. The rest of them are going to die just, just based on infighting. And you know what? Maybe maybe a Skeet? S steer? Skeet? Yeah. He's going to start to tell another sappy Skeet story, Triple S, and someone's just going to kill him to put him out of his misery. You know, at this point, seeing how yeah. poorly planned this mission is, when you ask me how many of the Aldani 7 are going to die, I'm going to say eight. <laughs> <laughs> They're not doing too well. You won up to me, Bubba. I didn't but, think it was possible. But uh, maybe what I would say is how they'll die. I think many yeah. are going to commit suicide. Rather than listen to Nemec's, his ramblings again about, listen, the rebellion means this, the oppression means this. It's like, yes, Nemec, we get it, please. You know, you yeah, really think Nemec's, Nemec's stories are worse than Skeet's? I mean, come on. <laughs> oh, that is, okay, well, that is a good question. Listeners, if you want to get in on this about Skeen's tattoo stories and how his brother's tree farm drowned and died, you know, uh, or do you like Nemec's? You know, very passionate. He wrote a manifesto. Which story is worse? Let's hear it. And then finally, Catfish, I want to keep this up, even though it's a bit ridiculous. We keep saying, well, who's going to be Cassian's sister? And was she in this episode? So we've got a segment called Cassian's Sister of the Week. And the only one I think could be good for it is Lita, Mon Mothma's daughter. What if, what if she's not actually Mon Mothma's daughter, but her adopted daughter, and she's actually Cassian's sister? Ooh, twist. Well, wow. I'm going to go with the closest in age that I did not previously guess, and I'm going to go with Luthen's assistant. Ooh, that's very good. I thought you were going really cold <laughs> because Cassian's looking pretty old. I thought you were going to say, I'm going to go in the closest in age, Edie. Well, I did. I did Zero Edie last wrong. week. I did it already. <laughs> Edie's been done. Oh, how cold. Okay, listeners, those are our quick hits. Once again, if you like this podcast and you enjoy hearing two silly guys talk about fun TV shows, we are covering House of the Dragon on HBO Max Plus. H HBO, HBO Max. On it's HBO Max. Max. You can it's find HBO that by After Dark and During Dark. Oh, heck yeah. You can find that on a podcast feed entitled The Joffrey of Podcasts. Search for that. 
the Job Free Podcast, wherever you listen to fun podcasts. And if you love murder mysteries, like who's going to kill Nemec? In just one week, we're going to start covering a murder mystery that's all around the world. It's called Magpie Murders. It's a new show here in the United States. It's going to air on PBS, but around the world, it's on the BritBox app. And so if you love murder mysteries and having friends try to solve them with you, please check out the Double P podcast feeds for that fun show. And Bubba, this is great because every single one of our listeners will figure this out before me. So mm -hmm. not only will there be some fun, some amusement, some serious discussion of red herrings, but also mm -hmm. you'll get to feel superior. But Bubba, right. what I want to know is what are we calling this? Are we calling this eel pie murder? Are we calling it scheduled <laughs> murder? Murder <laughs> scheduled smartly? What do we call what, what We're going to call gonna it whatever e Edie's next insult to Cyril is. <laughs> So, I love it. Next episode six, whatever Edie says, that's what the podcast will be. And speaking of Edie, Catfish, we visited, by my count, three different systems, three different planets this week. We're on the heist planet of Aldhani, where Clem is. We also went a brief time back to Ferrix, the original home base or the second home base of Cassian. And we spent some time in Coruscant. Which of these three systems do you want to jump to first? Oh, you know, I want to go to Ferrix first. Let's get the appetizer out of the way uh, before we head on to our entree. Well, Ferrix was kind of overseen by the corporate system, the corporate police, but Cyril's failed mission took that away. And we just have a brief scene of the Imperial ISB officer, Blevin, coming in and taking charge, because now the Empire's going to run this. The corporation screwed it up. The Empire's going to go in and lay down the law. And Blevin is leading troops into town. And the this show, it's, it's times is so petty. Like you mentioned last week, Catfish, it's about office politics. And Blevin's second in command, a guy named Captain Tegan, he wants a new title. Uh, it, was it a prefect? He wants to be head boy. Yeah, but, but Blevin says he can be head girl as far as he's concerned. <laughs> Just get it done. And I want to know who is living in that. <laughs> They're displacing a lot of people. Yep. Uh, you don't usually see condos converted into office buildings. Although I don't think converted is right the word. Forcibly oh, no. evacuated. Yeah, I think exactly. that would be the right word. What do you think those places are going for on Redfin? <laughs> Zero dollars now. There's something called eminent domain. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll be back in Ferrix soon enough to see more fallout from Cassian's crimes and our boy Karn's mistakes. Do you want to then jump to Coruscant? Let's jump there next. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. The episode starts on Cyril. He Here it's episode five, and Cyril, not Andor, is getting the opening shot where, like, the sun is riding, rising. And he's in his jammies and he's looking out his window at the rising sun and where in A New Hope, Luke looked at the twin sons and like dreamed of a better world. Cyril, he's like crying. He's not dreaming of a better world. He's like, this stinks <laughs> for Cyril Karn. Any thoughts well, he's on, participating. Uh, he's participating in what I like to call double L. Okay, double L. Yeah, Linus longing. <laughs> Oh, if only my bro were here. We He's thinking of the days, us. instead of being slapped and told how useless a human being was, he was constantly giving positive reinforcement. Oh, sir, man. excellent job in the bathroom, sir. Good number two. <laughs> Way to finish that big meal all by yourself. Here's a gold star. <laughs> and speaking of that meal... This sounds ridiculous how in easily influenced I am, but I saw that and I almost went straight to the supermarket to buy some cereal. I'm like, oh, that looks yummy. But what doesn't look yummy or what doesn't look appetizing or happy at all is a mother who throws around ice cold disses. Edie Karn has gone into the pantheon of ice cold disses in one episode. <laughs> this is insane. Yeah, exactly. I had to put it in there. I mean, that is callback. Using the ice cold. I know. Oh man, that's that's all the way back to our podcast on the terror. But she is just crushing him. I'm gonna give some now, but no, they'll, they'll all they're all gold. They'll all come back. You might as well wear a sign that says, "I promise to disappoint you." That's your son, lady. Oh my god. Shame we couldn't have seen each other more when you were flourishing. I'd have a memory to sustain. 
<laughs> and then this isn't as ice cold, but you know what this line means, catfish. Cyril's in trouble. He's unemployed. What does she say? She says, I'm calling in Uncle Harlow. Oh, man, I knew he had connections. We knew it. I called it. It wasn't a surprise, really. Anybody who was watching the ineffectiveness of Cyril <laughs> and how far he'd gotten, yep. which was being an underling cop on this planet where nobody's got sent to. But still, to make it that far, he needed connections. Uncle Harlow, let's just finish off poor Cyril. Uh, we we see him a couple more times. The first time it comes back, he's having the same miserable breakfast, and his mom's telling him, guess what? Uncle Harlow doesn't think much of you. <laughs> nice. God, and nice. she's like, and then she says, you know, hopefully you can learn by uh, watching or listening to Uncle Harlow. And he's like, well, I wasn't able to listen to his side of the conversation to learn anything, but I certainly heard all the times you smacked me down. Oh, my God. Then it ends the episode where he's back in his room. And what is he doing? He's staring at a hologram of Cassian. It's like Cassian has become his white whale, his Moby Dick, the thing that has mm. ruined his life. Mm. This is not good. Hashtag creeper. Any ideas, Catfish, where Cyril's going to go? How? Why are we even watching him? He's not doing anything but failing in place. He's not even falling down or going up. He's continuing to fail in place. What do you think? Yeah, I, 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 I'm curious what he's going to do because he is, you know, he's not the only one who's pursuing this line of reasoning He's just the only completely inept one pursuing this line of reasoning. <laughs> so I'm not sure what he's there for because we have got someone who is effective doing this. So I don't know what he's going to do, but whatever it is, it's going to be hilarious. Well, Blevin has made it back from Ferrex. He's back at ISB headquarters. And Dedra, the female officer at ISB, she is obsessed with that stolen stuff that she's in charge of finding. And she's got her underling. You know, if this underling takes a bullet in the chest, maybe there'll be an opening for our boy Cyril Karn. But what do you think about Dedra and her obsession? She's almost like a mirror image of Cyril, isn't she? You know, Cyril was given this thing. His superior told him, ignore those murders. It's fine. She last week went to Kyburn, went to Partagas, and was like, hey, that those these missing... Imperial pieces of equipment. I think I've got a lead on one. And he's like, no, write your damn report. And she's focused on it. Any thought on De Dedra, Deidre, however you pronounce her evil name? Well, it's interesting because she's got her own kind of Linus Lickspittle. Yes. But unlike Linus and our boy Cyril, she still seems more effective than this dude because oh, yeah. one of his axioms in life apparently is it's too random to be random which is my second favorite axiom after it's too organized to be organized. <laughs> is it Marie Kando who would take issue with this statement? <laughs> I mean, I just don't, it's too random to be random at that point. You, you're really just, you're too many rationalizations into your day. Wait, I just figured it out. He said mm -hmm. it's too random to be random. I right. think QAnon has just revealed himself. <laughs> Q, there he is There he is So those are our Imperials We've got our two Rebels also on Coruscant We've got Mon Mothma and Luthen So let's go to Mon Mothma Well, and... but, but let me ask you oh, a quick sorry. question yeah. first Who, based on this episode and previous episodes Who are the more effective Rebels? The ones mm. who are actually trying to rebel, rebel Or the ones who who are within, who are rebelling against what their supervisors are telling them. <laughs> who are Great the point. more effective rebels? Oh, Gavin, you have revealed the secret of this, of this show. We're seeing rebellions of, among the empire and an empire of rebellions. I love it. I love it. So good. Who do you think? I mean, that's a great question. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, well, we have to take Cyril and Linus out of it, <laughs> along with our poor chief forgotten already uh yeah but let's see i think i think that uh i think this woman is gonna pull it off all right Dedra, Dedra? yeah 
All right, well, let's go to the non-rebelling rebels then and to Mon Mothma's household. And last week, oh, my God, her husband, Perrin, was the absolute no, These worst. are the rebelling non-rebels. Right. Oh Get it God. straight, Bubba. It's so terrible, so terrible. So daughter Lita, who's oh. Mon Mothma's child, is a frustrated teen who wants dad to drive her to school so she doesn't have to go with mom. Oh, my God. She thinks her mom is so busy showing off. It's all about you, isn't it? And then Lita has an ice cold this, but it's also the thing you don't say to your mother. She says, I didn't choose this conversation. Oh, my God. Terrible children. Well, I mean, you know, this makes it simple. Both the husband and the daughter are riding together. Mm, You know, I would say a little cut of the gas cord, the brake cord, whatever, (laughs) whatever it takes. That's two problems with one stone. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. And then later on, we see Mom Mothma again. It's nighttime. She's dressed to the nines. Great outfit, Mom Mothma, who I shouldn't say this out loud, but looks a bit like my ex, but with red hair. I mean, you know, and I'm like, why do I find Mom Mothma so attractive? And yet I want Perrin to win. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) It does look a bit like my ex. Yeah, okay. I'll edit that statement out. But um, they're in there riding with the car. And the husband, he doesn't care. Or is he a spy? He's asking her about the new foundation she's involved with. And he doesn't care about the driver's name, even though the driver is a spy. I think he probably knows this driver is a spy, Chloris. And he's so frustrated with his wife, he doesn't want to, he wants to make sure the driver takes the expressway so they get home quick and he doesn't have to be trapped in the car with him. And so, Catfish, this is my question for you. Does yeah. Mon Mothma join and start the rebellion to overthrow the galactic empire just to have something to do to get away from her husband <laughs> like oh god i could go home and talk to my husband or i could go to this rebellion holy meeting. cow i mean she could have done all that or once again just a simple snip of the break court i'm sorry i love this now bubba i got a question yeah. for you sure is parent an actually active smart person trying to ferret her out or is he just a buffoon who loves to get puffed up by these other imperialist idiots? Is, yeah, boy, that is a great question, Catfish. I lean towards the latter, that he's just like, okay, a lot of people in the galaxy may be suffering, but I'm doing great. Look at me. Hey, uh, it's all good. Why do we have to, you know, why do I have to put the recyclables in the recycle bin? I mean, I would assume that's it. But I would be blown away if Perrin is wiser than meets the eye and is kind of a double agent and knows his wife has been causing trouble for his Oh, buddies. interesting. So, so you it. think he's it. really imp- an imperialist and not just a I, I know? I think so. I think so. What do you think? That's a great question. I, you know, he doesn't seem that he seems vain and not smart to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not that he doesn't know what these people are. But I don't think he's smart enough to be politically agitating. He just sees which way the wind's blowing, and he wants to be on the side of power. Love it. Man, smart analysis. Listeners, what do you think? Tweet to us at Double PHQ on YouTube. Write down in the comments your Perrin thoughts. Meanwhile, our buddy Luthen over at his antiquities shops, he's wasting his time. He's listening to Rebel Communications about the mission that he knows aren't going to come in. You know, he didn't, he probably told them radio silence while you do this, but he's got something going on with him and his assistant. He's like, Hey, do you have your go bag ready in case this all blows up in our face? And there was something about that, the way he asked and the way Luthen is acting. It made me think it feels like Luthen wants to be caught and, and to have to run and not live this double life, this fake life. That's what I was feeling. What did you think? Catfish? Well, I thought of two alternatives. One is that he just hates having to comb his hair and be friendly, and he just wants to give that up. The other thing is he will do anything to avoid what I like to call double C. Wait, double C? Yeah, coin cleaning. (laughs) Oh, how did you get those coins so dirty? They were out on display. What are you doing, (laughs) Lufus? They're hundreds of years old. Time to polish them up. So that's it. Um, did you miss Luthen? I, I, the episode's only been out for a couple hours, but I heard people saying, oh man, Luthen was so good in these previous episodes. I missed him. Did you miss Luthen in this episode, Catfish? His bluster and Barney and his demand that Clem get the job done. 
I just want that same completely frightening moment from the previous episode where he combs his hair, smiles, and <laughs> then it turns into a frozen rictus, and I'm just afraid for my life. <laughs> it's coming. It is coming. Thank God. But we're going to be going to Ald Hani. Oh, look at this transition. Professional Old Ald Masters we are. Ald Hani. So Clem, Cassian, mm -hmm. wakes up in his bunk. His stuff's been moved, and he becomes a little double C. Double C? Yeah, he becomes Clem questioning. <laughs> He, yeah, he gets a little Clem questioning. That's that's a great double C, Bubba. Uh, do you like how I did how I did it there? <coughs> it's and beautiful. he's got his buddy, Angry Skeen, who hates Clem as much as he hates wearing a shirt. And uh, they have this, you know, little back and forth. Skeen is saying, "Hey, uh, tell me about this gun. This is kind of a fancy gun, an, an important person's gun." And Andor has a great line. He's <laughs> like, "Listen, the person I took the gun from, I didn't get their name." Oh, man, so nice. good, Andor. Once again, it's back and forth, back and forth, and so we're getting to meet this team and learn a little bit about them, which we really didn't last week. And uh, Yeah, it's really subtle because Skeen is like, let me give you a, a two-second break dip background oh, yeah. for all these characters. Even though I don't trust you, I'm going to give you enough information to identify them later. Skeen is like, I looked at their LinkedIn pages. This is what they said. And their Facebook pages and their and their uh, other pages, because he says, Cinta, she's already sharing a blanket, if that's what you're thinking. Oh, way to shoot down Clem if he wants to get some noogie on the side. You know, I'm not sure that going into a uh, seven sap suicide mission is the best choice if you want to pick up a little action on the side. <laughs> so, uh yeah, that, that that those seven people are. It's like a Tinder camp. Oh yeah, uh, we could all die tomorrow. Mmm, mm, cuddle puddle. <laughs> I mean, you might as well do something other than drink the Dre milk. Yuck! From Nemec. Oh, this stuff is gross. You could live on it, but you may question your existence after a few days. Dang, Cassian uh, signed uh, up to appear on Naked and Afraid. <laughs> It was kind of shocking, right? You would look and you'd say, well, it's the blue milk I want to stay away from. Yeah, exactly. But apparently the white milk is the one that will make you wonder about the choices you've made in life. Now, Catfish, I joked about it in my double P, my pol Polaroid prop, but did it excite you that somebody had taken an old Polaroid fold-up camera and turned it into a prop? Or did you think, these lazy bastards, what was your thought? I thought, I was like, I, I mean, obviously I thought the same thing as you and 90%, uh, 97% of our audience has ever seen a Polaroid camera. Yeah. I thought, has the Star Wars universe just given up? I mean, we're at the point where it's like, yeah. let's turn that trash can into a droid. We'll put a couple arms on it. You know, <laughs> we're going to have right a, about, a there's jump an rope. Age line. There's an age line for those Polaroid folding cameras. So do you think, what, it would it be 50, uh, 30 years from now, they're going to be like, oh, look at this great Star Wars prop, and it'll be a Motorola flip phone? <laughs> You know, like as technology falls away or they'd be like, I got this. Gr oh, I got this great radar jammer. And they pull out a VHS deck. I mean, I thought that they were actually gilding the lily here because first our guy says uh, we've grown reliable on Imperial tech. And then he says there are things we've forgotten. And I thought, use this camera. I mean, navigation <laughs> device to remember the past. <laughs> If you're going to forget something, you could take a picture. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's Nemec. He, you know, he's got all the classic stuff. He runs a flea market on the side. Good for him. And so uh, the character, the one of the, another member of the Seven Saps, Terramin, he comes up. He saves Clem from the Nemec's manifesto. And... Terraman brings Clem in, and this is the point where Clem slash Cassian realizes, wait a minute, this ship you say we're going to fly out on, nobody knows anything about it, how it works, how to fly it? Not good. Holy cow. And they really, it's clear these guys needed Clem's help. They're like, nah, we don't need you. Uh, yeah. And then, 
I mean, he snaps back at Vader. He's like, look, I'm flying this thing. We can say it's your idea. I don't care. She's a strong leader. And then the guy yeah. whose name I don't remember, the dude with the beard, takes Cassian on a vision quest to realize the setup of the heist using only hand movements and scrap wood. He's right. like, pointing, he's like, here's that thing. And I'm like, you mean in that general, like, far away area? So imagine if you, right, that's when your family can't afford Disney and they take you to like one water slide in the motel's pool and they're like, okay, imagine this is the Magic Kingdom. Imagine, you see this pile of sticks? Imagine <laughs> it's the Imperial base. <laughs> what can you get, Tara? Man, come on. Yeah, come on. this hot dog I'm holding is a turkey leg. <laughs> now, Lieutenant Gorn, who's our man on the inside, he leads some flunkies up to the temple, which is just this little stone structure outside the base. And he is upset. He's like, are you using this temple for target practice? Hey, the big storm, the meteor storm is coming. We got to make this look good. We got an imperial visitor coming, and you're making this place look like a dump. Tip, yeah, tip. Exactly. This looks, this looks like your man cave. I mean, you got the keg over here. You got the dartboard <laughs> over here. Clean it up. Clem a.k.a. Cassian. He doesn't like being physically touched. He doesn't like people no. touching his stuff. I called him Francis from the movie Stripes. <laughs> Everybody calls me psycho. No, none of you guys touch my stuff. But man, something's going on here. And there, once again, I'm, I'm teasing the show and I'm saying I, I don't like how it's kind of formless. But the fact that they kind of scatter like rats when that TIE fighter comes and they're so afraid... It was effective. I got afraid. I'm like, oh man, dude, you know, hide I mean, your stuff. That you know who was piloting that TIE fighter, right? Who? It was Tom Cruise. He totally he buzzed them, he buzzed the tower. They're like, oh damn you, my coffee spilled. There dude, we go. He, Another he, 30 year old uh, reference. <laughs> Nemec also says, Hey, surprise from above is never as shocking as one from below. Ooh, yeah, love it. They're gonna sneak up from below and crush the Empire. Now, Gorn, again, he's the man on the inside. He and a flunky are talking, you know, just kind of talking shop. And the flunky talks about, hey, because of this meteor shower, a lot of these natives, a lot of these almost hicks is what he's implying, are going to be here. And then he says that one of the, they, these natives smell funny. Oh, my God, not cool, dude. And he did not like that, even though it seemed like he was not a native. But he yeah. definitely did not appreciate that. Yeah, later, later we find out that why did Gorn flip to the good guy's side? It's because he fell in love with a local woman, and then he lost her. And it's like, I came to her planet, the company I'm with, the Empire treated her planet like crap, displaced her people in a lot of ways because they would normally live right there. And uh, he became disillusioned, and now he's working with Vel. Move on. <laughs> And uh, one final thing about Lieutenant Gord, he's, you know, once again, troops, we've got visitors coming. We've got to make this base look perfect. And I love, this is such a real life look at, at the Empire. There are these two, what you would call privates there. And they're like, dude, nobody wants to get stationed here. We got stationed here. Can we at least see the meteor shower? Can we at least do something fun to make this worthwhile being out here in the middle of nowhere? Love it. Wonderful. Wonderful stuff. Oh, yeah. Triple G. Wait, Triple G. Yeah, gullingly, gruff Gorn. He played them like a fiddle. He did. That was really fun. He's like, well, if you want to paint the fence, Tom Sawyer's friends, sure. Yeah, all right. Love it. Love it. Now, Skeen, the guy with the tattoos, the member of the group, he has not been trusting Cassian because Cassian seems competent and knows how to fly the escape ship. Who knows? But he took the kyber crystal off Clem, and he's saying, hey, what kind of person brings a treasure to a robbery? And I loved that line. And this kyber crystal is apparently a sky kyber crystal. And yeah, Cassian, get it together. That If that's worth 30,000 credits, don't just wear it around your neck, dude. What, where else did you want to put it? You wanted him to wear it as like a uh, Do you remember where, Christian Wa where Christopher Walken kept that watch in Pulp Fiction? Uh, yeah. Come on. Bubba, though, it was only Sky Kyber. So I don't know. Because you know what they say. Kyber from above is never as shocking as Kyber from below. I am shocked that you would try that right now, but sure. <laughs> I did. 
<laughs> I did it. So we keep hearing about, you know, ooh, the superiors are coming, visitors are coming to the base. And the one thing this show really does is it has these spaceships flying in the distance. And so you see this one spaceship flying in the distance. And I thought, wow, you never see it like that. So you can really see how far away it is, see it almost from the perspective of our main characters. I thought that was great. And it's there at the end when kind of it's all blowing up when Clem gives up the ghost and he says, dude, you want to know I'm here? You want to know I'm here? I'm getting cold, hard credits, baby. I'm getting paid. Oh, my God. Not only that, you know, he, like I said earlier, he says, you know exactly who I am. (laughs) Clem-ish. And then he (laughs) rightly says, this is awesome when he calls them out. He says they're just chicken. It's nerves. And that's what I like to call reverse double C. Reverse double C. Yeah, Clem questioning. Instead of questioning Clem, Clem, Clem. this is Clem questioning. Here we go. I thought you were going to say Clem's chicken (laughs) call-outs. That would have been triple C and also much better than what I said. Now, Catfish, do you think any of the other members of the Seven Saps were thinking, wait, we can get paid? (laughs) We've been drinking this terrible Dre milk all this time, and at the end of this, we could get gold hard cash? Come on. Well, I'm not sure they're thinking that. I mean, it's funny that him just saying, look, I'm just here for the bucks actually is kind of reassuring to them. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, that's fine. Our boy whose name I keep forgetting, that preacher Paul is what I'm going to call him. (laughs) He's like he's there because he's a true believer. They all seem like they're true believers. If you were not a true believer, why would you go on this suicide mission? Say that again. And we think they're going to start the heist, but no, they were just marching from one camp to another. I mean, good grief. Man, it's true quadruple S. Quadruple S. Yes, seven sap seeking steps. They're getting In shelter. <laughs> um, once again, let me talk some positive. This is a real dam that's in Scotland. And it's funny, when we talk about Obi-Wan or the Mandalorian at times, when they film in Southern California, we're like, yeah. Geez, this is just Southern California. This is right outside my back door. You know, that's 15 miles from my house. So we don't get that excited. I wonder if people in Scotland see this beautiful dam that they've digitally made to look like an imperial base. And they go, ah, man, that's just up the road. (laughs) You know, like, like, do they get as nonplussed about it as we are? Like, wow, that's just Southern California. And hey, that's just Scotland. We find out, once again, skiing. He's in it for a real reason. He's in it because his brother, you know, died after the flood of his farm. I mean, this, I was a little confused by the uh, the Triple S. Triple S. Yeah, Skeen's sappy story. Oh. Uh, because after he tells it, yeah, he says, that's as close to an apology as you're going to get. I have two questions about this, Bubba. All right, let's Number see. one. Why does he have to apologize? Number two, that was an apology? He has to apologize because he did steal the Sky Kyber crystal off his neck. How about that? You you should apologize for that. I mean, it's because he was suspicious scheme the whole time. He doesn't really have to. It, it They already didn't trust him. Okay, fine. Okay, so he that's great. You answered question number one. Okay. How is telling a story about how you care about this personally, as opposed to this guy who's only in it for the cash, how is that an apology then? Well, Catfish, you're right. And I did ignore your second question. So to apologize for your second question, my younger brother, Gavin, one time, <laughs> he one time stubbed his toe and he he never got over it. That's as close to an apology as you're ever going to get. That's good enough for me. (laughs) The final thing about this uh, episode that we did talk about is that, is it just to steal, you know, the the payroll for a quarter or whatever? Because Vel hands off command to Terramin. And so what are Vel and Cinda going to be up to in the next episode? Any guesses, any thoughts what they could be up to? I mean, Bubba, I thought last week I speculated uh, that this was just s- sabotage, pure and simple. Now, Ooh, the money is always helpful. Great. 
but it is sabotage. I don't think that uh, Gorn is doing all this just to rip off the Empire. No, that is a uh, great point. You know, in so his he love, wants more he's payback. Just, right, they're destroying his loved loved one's home world. Yeah, of course you don't just want money. What it's if you could still, destroy their base and get money? Heck yeah, yeah. let's do it. I mean, well, let's be honest about it. If you destroy the base and kill the most people on it, it could take them forever to realize that the money is gone. I mean, if you bury it in rubble, they won't even know that. But hopefully at that point, they someone might go, hey, you know what? Maybe, maybe there are people coming after us. This is another random thing that proves that nothing is random. <laughs> I would, however, be yeah, this concerned. This is so random. It's like, it can't be random. That it's like, all right, we got, we're a lowly, pitiful group of seven. Yep. But you know what? That's too many. Five of us are going to do this <laughs> one thing, and two, we're going to do this other thing. There's too many, too many, too many cooks in the castle. Hey, that's the episode. Talking love. it through, even though it's a bit formless, it reminds me of all the stuff I love and all the stuff I love to uh, have fun with. Listeners, once again, we want to know how you think. What we say is just silly talk amongst us. You're part of our inner circle. You're part of our friends. The way you can really be a part of the conversation is reach out to us at Double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Double PHQ, and on YouTube. There's a reason why those comments exist. Go down in the comments and tell us what you thought of this episode catfish are you ready for our games uh, i'm completely ready for our games well, what is the first one the man delicious line of the episode all right so we split this into two categories funny and badass so for funny i only have one that i proposed and that was nemix dre milk you can live on it you may question your existence after a few days oh yes oh, do you have yeah. any more funny ones bubba well, they're funny in that I love Karn getting dissed. So anything, anything his mom Edie said would be good. But I, I also, I'll give it to Nemec, mainly because I don't think he's going to make it through the next episode. Oh man, spoiler alert for Nemec! All right, I've got a, I've got four for badass. The oh. first one is emasculating Edie when she says to her son, "My assumption is you have no prospect for the future." Um. Ice cold. Man, if I hadn't been told that a million times. <laughs> uh, then Cassian says, I'm here to win and walk away, which is a very good Mandalorian line. No, oh, that's good. Bell says, uh, after my boy Skeet and Clem get into it, and she says, give him the stone. You can kill him later. Hell yeah. But that my, is a good line. That's a good my line. My favorite is a little bit of back and forth between Mr. and Ms. Mothma when he says, when were you going to tell me about this new foundation? She says, I didn't think you'd be interested. He says, why? She says, it's charitable. <laughs> Ouch. I scold the heck yeah. He shut her down. His oh, response man. to that was, hmm. <laughs> And that's the best thing to say. Nothing else, you know, nothing else uh, to mention there. And for that, I'm going to give it to that one. Perrin, you deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, admittedly, you, you were on the, uh, you were on the uh, wrong end of it, but I still love it. Yeah, I'm going to give it to him, too, because he walked right into it. I'm not sure that our boy, our sweet, sweet and soft Cyril... <laughs> deserved everything he got no because it just kept coming but perrin you deserved it hell yes exactly right take a bow perrin you deserved it and have that bow right over the edge of one of those <laughs> cliffs uh one of those uh, balconies in coruscant because you are the voice now it's time for the bounty hunter guild battle who's gonna win the puck and claim the prize this mm -hmm. is where Catfish and I debate an item that came up in the episode. This week, Catfish, mm -hmm. there's this big thing. I just mentioned it a couple of minutes ago. Is it really a big scandal that Cassian's doing it for the credits? I mean, Cassian wants the cheddar, baby. He's got to get those crazy, crazy quids, man. Do you not respect freedom fighters who aren't getting paid? <laughs> you know, like, do freedom fighters have to do it for free? 
Do, is is the free and freedom fighters mean they're fighting for free? And how many dead presidents did George Washington get for overthrowing the government and King George? What do you think here? Is it should they be upset that Cassian's doing it for money, or are they glad it's kind of a pure reason, just like their reasons are pure? I think it helps them to understand him because they don't trust him, and that's always an uh, an answer to understand. However, hmm. they are all, like I say, they are true believers, and true believers will sacrifice their lives for it, where somebody who's getting paid at some point makes a calculation, I don't care how much money it is, it's not worth my life. Mm. So I would say you do have to, you can't, you can't trust uh, paid uh, fighters with your life. But we do. I would argue against you, Catfish, and to say we do. The members of the U.S. military, I have great respect for, but they are getting paid. They are defending our freedom, and at the same time, they're getting cold, hard cash. Why is that wrong for and or to get cash? I think, I think it makes perfect sense. So many shows about mercenaries, whether they be real mercenaries like the A-Team or... <laughs> mercenaries just by happenstance, like the Mandalorian, they still do the work. Give them some cash. I'm down with it. Okay, so this is, you you led me perfectly into my rebuttal, Uh which is the mercenaries are getting paid a lot more money than our military is, but Mm -hmm. they have no skin in the game, really no skin in the game. So they will, could bail out at some point. Whereas the true believers will not bail out. Are you sure they won't bail Organa? Oh, Call back. No. That is a groaner. Oh, no. The biggest no. groaner we've ever oh, done God. on the oh, Pirates God. Passion podcast. Hey, what do you guys think? Is it cool for credit or do you need to be down with the cause? Once again, write to us and let us go. And now All right, so, Bubba, double M, double Matt M. Murdick, who usually provides... Matt Murdock's music analysis, yeah. that's quadruple M, he is off this week. He what? can't be here every week. We don't pay him enough money. He's a mercenary. He demanded 200,000 credits oh, to do the okay. music now, for today. Now he I will, agree. You're right. You got to do it for the cause. <laughs> he will be back next week. Okay. So that's it. I know we're, it's absence makes the heart grow fonder. So we are going to give you a little music because our last game before we get into listener feedback is... What's that secret you're keeping? It's what question you want answered in the next episode, or what do you need explained to you about this episode? Bubba? I think what we need is more Mon Mothma's direct connection. Luther okay. last week was talking about, you got to get me the money. I need the money. And yes, he's going to pay Cassian, but if you're stealing all that payroll, why not just pay Cassian out of the payroll you're stealing, right? So what is Mon Mothma's real role for the rebellion? I think she's fascinating. I love this crazy dynamic with her husband and her daughter. But what is her real skin in the game? Why is she doing it? What exactly is she doing? Why are her husband and child so negative towards her? That's the secret I want to know you're keeping. How about you? Bubba, this is interesting because it kind of relates to the last question we had, the Bounty bounty Hunter. Say it again. The Bounty but, Hunter Guild Battle. Thank you. We've only done like 25 episodes uh, in this only universe. 25. All right. So for me, yeah. either it's a plot hole or mm. there has to be, I still feel like there's something more that Cassian needs besides the money. I know we've established that Mm, the only thing he cares about is looking for his sister, but it still feels weird when it gets to this point. Sure, he's on this planet. He's with these people, but he could just walk off. I mean, when it gets to the point where nobody knows how to fly the thing, you cannot spend (laughs) money if you're dead. So to me, it feels (laughs) like, even though he said it's just about the money, right? I really feel like there needs to be an additional explanation. And if there isn't, I'm going to feel a little wonky about the whole thing. And, you know, maybe they're just not going to provide. But I feel like there's got to be something extra 
do, do you think I'm completely off here and they're not going to give us anything extra? You're completely off, but not here. So at okay. this point, you're correct. Hey, listeners, we always say we want to know what you think. Do you have things you want to know? Get it to us before episode six hits. And we care about your feedback so much. Let's get to the feedback you've given us so far. And even though the episode's only been out a couple episodes, we do have feedback on this episode five. Once again, from Sean Gregan at HeyRef on Twitter, a great double L loyal listener. I mean, he says it's uh, right in your face, Bubba, another crackling installment in the series. Oh, yes. Another dialogue heavy episode, actors chewing out each other and chewing up scenery. <laughs> it's Star Wars, David Mamet style. Ooh, Sadly, haters will say not enough action. Oh, why you are being directly called out, Bubba. But like Christmas, the anticipation is so exciting. Mon Mothma should definitely kill her husband. <laughs> Why just her husband? I know. What about kill that the, daughter? Yeah, kill the fruit of the poisonous tree. Just start over, Colleen. Well, I, I do want to say, Sean, I didn't say there had to be action. I had to say, you know, if you're not going to do this heist until episode six, once again, get Karn moving on his story rather than keeping him in place. Get Mom Mothma moving on what her next step is mm -hmm. rather than having them stand in place. So that doesn't mean action. I just need a little plot movement as opposed to actual movement. And I think I didn't tell you that bef this before because I hate telling you this, but I think that is a very sharp and smart observation. Oh, I mean, you oh it hurts. Flip that it hurts. Listeners. It hurts. <laughs> it hurts. Yeah, that could be the intro for all the podcasts going on. Hey, all right. So we got some on episode four. You want to read that we, catfish? We did. Yeah. Endless Mike, our buddy, endless Mike. Oh, three said he'll give episode four, eight out of 10. Ooh. He enjoyed watching it. But then it just kind of ended, as they all do. They all do, but 8 out of 10 is a very good score. So that's two pretty high people on these and or episodes, Sean and Mike. What did Camille say? She said, I hope it picks up. I love all Star Wars, but I'm a bit bored. Mm -hmm. I feel like they should put out two episodes at a time each week. Now, Camille, if you've been listening... Yeah. You know that would be a problem since there are three episode arcs. That would, <laughs> I think it's it would be either one or three. Yes. Yeah. Funny story when trying to explain the BBY before the Battle of Yavin, which is when the first Death Star battle happened. Timeline to my husband. He told me stop. I don't speak Nerdanese. Oh, 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 oh. punishment for save it for the divorce. Punishment for <laughs> double H. Double Harley H. husband, oh, Harley no. husband. Could you know what? Uh, I, I I hesitate to mention it again, but I have said twice that uh, snipping a break line is a good way to, to peacefully <laughs> end a relationship. Right, but we claim no legal responsibility <laughs> for saying this. We're just pointing it out, ir irregardless of how certain husbands might. <laughs> It, uh, right, exactly, exactly. Do you speak, oh my God, my brakes no longer work? <laughs> <laughs> when that happened, his final words, Banta Pudu Solo. Wait, no, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's nerd, nerd and ease. Hey, my name's Bubba. You can find me on Twitter at Fit and Trim. That's F I T T E N T R I M, at Fit and Trim on Twitter. And I'm Catfish. You can hit me up at CJGMan67 on Twitter and at G-E-E-T-O-T-H-E Man on Instagram. Hit me up. Hit us all up. Next week is going to be episode six. What does that mean? We're going to happily for Bubba, we're going to come to the end of another storyline. Heck yeah. So and we're going to be at the halfway point in the series. All these smokes. We're going to be the halfway point. Matt Murdock will be back. If you didn't enjoy this episode... You might want to try us next episode because you will hear us on our sick passion. Hey, Clem. I love it. Clem, let, yeah, me, tell uh, you, let me tell you about my buddy's water farm that got killed by these trees. Oh, God. <laughs> Bring back the guy who's the true believer. Wait, wait. Oh, no, not Nemec. I'm telling my story. It's <laughs> no Nemec. <laughs>